Thanks, Murray. Um, next, we'd certainly like to get your reaction to uh, this concept of uh, involving the IGC more deeply in the Lake Winnipeg situation and in the Red River Valley. But before we do that, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Christine on behalf of the Red River Basin Commission, uh, Alex and on behalf of uh, the Lake Winnipeg Foundation, and uh, Bob as the ambassador for the uh, Lake Friendly Accord to uh, come up to the table at, at the front and, and give us a very short, your reaction to this concept. And, and then we'll throw it open to the floor and uh, for discussion and, and comment. And, and maybe in order, I'll ask uh, Alex if you could lead off, and uh, followed by Christine, and then Bob. Well, oh, as a, uh, I'm here as a uh, representative of the Lake Winnipeg Foundation, uh, but I must advise you that we haven't uh, considered this reference uh, as a board. So I'm offering you some of my own views on this issue. Uh, I think, though, it, a reference would help the foundation in terms of uh, uh, rolling out its uh, Lake Winnipeg Health Plan, which is essentially a nutrient management strategy, uh, reducing nutrients uh, uh, with eight priority actions. So I think that uh, a reference uh, would help to do that. But listening to uh, the speakers tonight, in particular Bob, uh, it, it raises many questions in my mind about the value of a reference in a short-term perspective or a long-term perspective. Uh, what we're facing uh, in Lake Winnipeg uh, in terms of its eutrophication, uh, the best science we have available is telling us that uh, uh, Eutrophication we're seeing in the lake is driven by increased flooding, increased water flows, which drive up the phosphorus content, and that's all related to climate change. So I don't know whether this board, uh, IRRB and IJC, really has the capacity to deal with climate issues. Uh, it is an international issue. You know, uh, are we, we are altering the hydrological cycle. And uh, I would expect that it might be a topic for the IGC to discuss. Uh, so I think that's my, I'm, I'm still not clear uh, how this can be an effective tool. I think it needs more discussion. And uh, certainly uh, uh, if things were, uh, if, if we could suggest that the next 50 years would be hydrologically the same way they were the first 50 years of this century, I would say, let's go for it, without any hesitation. But I'm not convinced yet that this is the answer. Um, I actually have to agree with Alex on this. Um, being a, a staff member for the Red River Basin Commission and the, the work that we do on an international level, um, I'm very aware of what's, what is being done down south in, Minis in Minnesota and North Dakota. Um, and I personally, I'm not sure if a, a reference would work because of the hydrological changes that we're undergoing. But also, I do know the great work the IRRB is doing, and uh, it may seem like a very long process. Um, but to come up with just a base number and say this is what needs to be done to reduce the uh, the phosphate levels within our waterways. Every uh, waterway is different, and the uh, the release of the nutrients from the land is different. And we know that overland flooding is our biggest cause of um, nutrient loadings within uh, the lake. And um, the Red River Basin Commission um, and several other organizations uh, through their uh, long-term flood solutions has mandated the 20% reduction. And I can say Minnesota and, and North Dakota are taking great strides in meeting that 20% reduction, which will hopefully reduce the phosphate levels uh, being released into Lake Manage or Lake Winnipeg. Um, they're also doing uh, lots of work south of the border um, with developing strategies in Minnesota for their nutrient remov removals. They're actually on the verge of getting ready to sign a strategy. North Dakota is a little bit farther behind. Um, so there is movement 
down south and with the flooding being part of the biggest issue and with climate change I agree with Alex it's very hard to make a definitive answer on whether or not this would be beneficial uh, we face uh, clearly very serious amount of problems and I think we need to take the threat seriously we have to rely on government to act but the problem is too big for government alone to address we have to work with government to deal with these problems, but government also has to work with civil society. And I have great respect for Minister McIntosh and his staff for seeing and acting upon the need for collaboration. And Colleen outlined the structure and the goals, but uh, clearly we need to energize this whole process. We need to use all the institutional tools that are available to us. And uh, when we look at equal and similar rights, uh, it's really interesting to note that we have uh, uh, institutionalized uh, equal and fair rights uh, in our relationship with the United States over the last hundred years through the Boundary Waters Treaty. And I would submit to you a hundred years later, the rest of the world is still trying to catch up with that institutionalization of fairness and equity in international transboundary agreements. And I think the Boundary and Waters Act is one of the, those tools which puts the values of I, IJC into relief. And I regret to say that uh, it appears to me, and I greatly fear this, that the Boundary and Waters Act appears to be losing some of its force. We don't appear to care that articles of the treaty are being violated. We don't appear to want to use the IJC to prevent and resolve disputes between our good neighbors. And uh, I commend utterly Christine and organizations like the Red River Basin Commission for working toward resolution of issues like eutrophication outside of the formal processes set out by the Boundary Waters Treaty. But I think also we need to understand that we have to have all the tools available to us. And evidence in the Great Lakes suggests that we shouldn't abandon successful approaches of the past. I and mean, one of the things that's really interesting is Lake Erie is probably the closest situation to Lake Winnipeg in this country. Roughly the same size, many of the same <coughs> problems. And uh, we haven't been able to sustain, to sustain successful collaboration in the Great Lakes. Now, four of the Great Lakes are in measurable decline and Lake Erie is now in as serious a state as it was in 1970. It's close to death again. And the question is, are we going to be able to energize the kind of international and national and provincial and organizational skills within those provinces uh, to collaborate in a way that we're going to be successful. And is there the same decline going to happen in Lake Winnipeg? Well, to prevent that, we have to use every visit vehicle, every device, every available means to prevent hydroclimatic change from overwhelming Lake Winnipeg. Uh, all I want to say is I think it's too early to write off the Boundary Waters Treaty, treaty and unwise to dismiss the potential value of the IJC. We can't fix Lake Winnipeg ourselves. We need our neighbors to help us. We may need to evoke Article 9 of the Boundary Waters Treaty, and if we do, we're going to need the IJC to help do that. We can't wait 60 years to get this done. Thank you. Uh, I now uh, ask for your feedback and any questions or comments. I, I guess before I can do that, um, uh, as some of you know, I'm, I've been consistently a, a Jeremiah on this issue. Um, we don't have time. Um, 60 years, uh, perhaps not six years. Uh, we have done nothing to make any significant reduction in nutrient inputs into Lake Winnipeg. An IJC reference would do at least a couple of things. It would ratchet up the sense of urgency, which is sorely lacking on this issue. And hopefully it would energize and engage the two national governments in the Red River Valley and, and the major source of the problem in Lake Winnipeg. So with that, uh, I'll throw it open to the floor for uh, comments, reaction. Very germane question, and it, it, it does relate to both of your points. Um, the governments would never, I would never stand up here and argue that the IJC should get a reference on climate change. It, that's not going to happen. And I don't think I could, in my wildest dreams, even create an argument for it. But what it, it can do 
what it has done and what it is doing is looking at climate change from a regional perspective. So in every basin where it has, say, existing structures, that it's looking to modify the way in which it works, whether it's in the Great Lakes as, as it did in Lake Superior or Lake Ontario or in the Asuyas, wherever there's some work, what it does do on its own, because it recognizes climate change, is, it's obvious, it has significant impacts on, on, on water resources. It takes the best regional climatic models it can. And I'm not, a, I'm not a climate scientist, but even the global models don't always agree, let alone the regional ones. So it takes the best regional climatic models it can and asks the scientists to look at what are the implications of different climatic scenarios for the work of the IJC. So when you're managing a system, water levels go up and down and water flows change. But if, if the climate is changing, and it, they, they haven't really even begun to address the non-linearity, they're just dealing with basic climate models. And they try to imagine what the impacts might be for themselves with respect to that, that watershed. So whether it's in the Red or the Rainy or the Asoyas or any other St. Croix or the Great Lakes, that's what they try to do because they have to. Um, they want to know, um, do we have to adapt? Uh, for example, in, in, they just finished um, looking at, they have regulation responsibilities out of Lake Superior and Lake Ontario. They have orders of approval. That's the quasi-judicial rule that we weren't talking about. So in those cases, the Lake Superior order was issued in the early 1900s. It was changed once in the 1970s, and now they wanted to change it again to make it up to date with all of the interest. The Lake Ontario one was issued in the 1950s and does not take into account environment, recreational building, and so on. Anyway, so they did major studies to look at ways in which they change, and it's a co major component of those studies was climate change. So they took regional climate, and some, in some cases, the climate change models, the regulation failed. I mean, the, the, the system just simply wouldn't operate. So all of which is to say the IJC is not oblivious to this. The science is there. They have boards telling them all of this, and they bring in the best climate scientists they can, and using global climate models, regional climate models, they try to come up with something that would, would make sense. Because when the rubber hits the road, if you're managing the system, you have to know how to manage it. And you know, coming down the pike, is the climate change going to be so dramatic that we won't be able to manage the system anymore? What can we do in advance, if anything? Can we make the system more robust, more adaptable? All of those things. So. While climate change is still happening, um, e almost every investigation that I've seen the IJC do, whether it's quasi-judicial or a reference one, there is a climate change component. And uh, I mean, if you looked at right here, it says, a hydrologic system is complex and influenced by many natural, which climate change impacts will exacerbate? So although we didn't talk about it, and I'm not trying to argue to convince anybody, because I don't think I can convince you. But I want to indicate that if the IJC were to do this, I don't think the IRB can do this, because I don't think they have a climate change component. But a reference could. They could bring climate change models into this, and they could add a climate change component to this, such that what would climate change do? They would look at much more extreme flooding conditions. I don't think the IRB is going to do that. They don't have the mandate, they don't have the manpower, but a reference could. It could have a climate change group that would say, okay, you're going to develop a nutrient management strategy. What if all hell goes to hell in a handbasket? And you have the kind of stuff that you're talking about here. What good is that going to be? How, how robust is it? How adaptive is it? I, I don't know for sure, but it's better than what, than what you'd have with nothing. And climate change is a global issue. We're not going to, IJC's not going to solve that. That's, that's much too big for us to deal with. But we can, they can deal with it in that small way. I hope that answers you. My hope is, <laughs> my hope, I, I, I'm not there anymore. I, I worked there for 30 years and I, I still think it's a, it's a magnificent institution that safeguards, I'll, I say this to my American colleagues, it safeguards Canadian interests, remarkably. Uh, yeah, it would, it would, my hope is that it would actually improve because it would bring all of those things around the table in a way that 
you probably don't have the opportunity to do now. Like, how often can you talk with IRRB and, and other institutions, large, large group of organizations and large initiatives that share? I mean, the other thing it could do, I was talking to somebody the other day, is nutrient management is not a new issue. <laughs> it's across the country. And the IJC has had experience in dealing with it in Lake Champlain. They've had experience dealing with it in the Red. They've had experience dealing with Lake of the Woods. And all of those people don't even talk to each other. And they're all, they're all within the IJC family. A reference might make them wake up and say, hey, why don't we convene um, an ad hoc group on nutrient management where people from these very different experiences can come together and we can talk about maybe developing some kind of generic models or using, because there's no one approach to solving the problem. So my hope was that at least could bring all of these different exercises together in a friendly way and not in a combative way, not in an antagonistic way, where you can share all the best things that you've learned and do all those good things better. Not, it wouldn't supplant it. Now, there's a natural tendency for people to resist that, right? Because you're always afraid that People from Ottawa and Washington are going to march in and take over, right? These horrible bureaucrats from, you know, black helicopters and all that. Well, I can't, if that's what you fear and that's what you believe, I can't change your perception. But all I can tell you is that in most, if not all, exercises that I've seen, most people walk away at the end with, with the perception, geez, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I did that. Now, there's the odd time where jurisdictions hate the IJC. When the IJC issued a a verdict on the Garrison Diversion Project. People in North Dakota said, we don't, we don't like that at all. When it issued a, a decision on the Flathead reference and said something shouldn't be built in British Columbia, they didn't like that at all. That's not to say that everything that the IJC says and does is like manna from heaven. It's not. Sometimes the people that live in the basins don't like to hear what it is the IJC says. But again, I'm sounding like I'm repeating myself, but the process is such that it will develop what at least an organized group of people. And a team like this usually consists of anywhere from 20 to 30 or 40 people. The best minds that you can bring together in a more focused way, I think is better than having disparate groups working entirely separately. Not bad, good, but it, it, I think it will make it better. It will make good things better. Sounds like a slogan for a commercial. But. The one reference that, that uh, I guess I had the most experience with was the Red River flooding reference. Um, and there was an awful lot going on post-97 with respect to flooding in the Red River Valley, as many of you recall. There's something called the International Flood Mitigation Initiative, IFMI, um, which was very well funded by both national governments. Uh, there were negotiations between the Government of Canada and Manitoba respecting uh, both compensation for flooding and, and uh, flood protection works into the future. A uh, number of other things, all the while that the Red River flooding reference was going on, and it was complementary to all of that. I mean, it, it, it wasn't something that, that uh, supplanted or interfered in some way with, with all of those other initiatives. In fact, the International Flood Mitigation Initiative, uh, which resulted in, in many things that still exist today, including a, a legislator's forum that brings together elected people from Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Manitoba in an annual conference, uh, rose from IFMI and the IJC, in fact, was represented on that uh, group of, of uh, opinion leaders from around the Red River Basin. So certainly in that instance, uh, not only good things resulted from the reference, but it was very much complementary to all those many other things that were going on at the same time.